Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and today my guest is Dr. Robert Foreman. Hi Robert. Hi, nice to be here Ian. And Robert has written a book that I loved. It's called Enlightenment Ain't What It's Cracked Up To Be, A Journey Of Discovery, Snow and Soul and Jazz In The Soul. And I read this book on holiday last year and I immediately emailed Robert because there's something here, there's an honesty here that's quite, for me, unique in spiritual books. And fortunately, he's now tied in a visit to London and we're in the studio together. And we're going to have, I think, a good adventure together the next uh, hour or so, just chatting about your life and, and just seeing where it's led you. Now, one of the things that I loved was that in your introduction, you talk about embracing the human messiness in life, which is sometimes quite rare in spiritual books. And then there was one sentence I'm going to read out, which, which um, hooked me in a way. This is the tale of a man who got the pot of gold for which he has longed and discovered that it wasn't what it had been cracked up to be, but then realized that he had indeed been given a pot of gold, only it was of a kind and nature wholly different than anything you could have known to wish for. I, the, there's, so, a, there's lots to talk about there, so yeah, let's, let's start yeah. with that. Um, first of all, when you, in your introduction, you began by saying that the book's honesty struck you. And I'm struck by that. And the reason is that I think that there is too little honesty in the spiritual world. There's a lot of descriptions that are very highfalutin and fancy and they make the spiritual life sound very different and surprisingly unattainable. And I think part of the lesson of my life is that I've had to let go of those fantasies and come down to what the spiritual life and what the human life is really about. And I think that being able to say that honestly is one of the lessons, I think, of the spiritual life. Because I think it's that honesty that helps people really become more of themselves. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing I want to comment on is this business about that the spiritual life and what's, what happened to me and what has happened to me over the years is not something I could have known to hope for. Because you can only know to hope for what you sort of know already. I can know to hope for the lagoon in a you know, in some place like Tahiti, because I've been to places like that. But the sh kind of shift we're going to be talking about over the next hour is not the kind of thing that you know to fantasize about. It's just too much its own thing, and not the kind of thing you know to wish for. So thanks for that. Nice and Okay. Yeah. So when we look at your early life, you had quite a lot of anxiety and fear, and like so many of us in, in when we're young, we want to find something that makes us feel good and happy. We want out of all the problems, all the neurosis. Yeah. And I know fairly early on you found TM, huh? Transcendental Meditation, huh? and what the Maharishi said was very appealing, that you would get out of this thought process and you'd be a peaceful, happy person. It wasn't only Maharishi, but it was definitely him. Uh, but it wasn't only him, and that uh, the longer I've, I've stayed in this world, the more I've come to realize that, that that promise of a perfect life, a wonderful life, a life with no anxiety, a life where everything is easy, that kind of promise has come not only from Eastern traditions, but from many Western traditions as well. And so that the, the kind of fantasizing that we all do is not entirely from our side. To some extent, that fantasizing, the sort of illusionizing of the spiritual path, if you will, um, is kind of built into the way it's talked about. And so that, it, yes, it was the Marshi that told me that life would be perfect. It was, but it wasn't only him. And it, this was sort of mm. in the air back when we were, when we were twenty. So when you first started to do TM, how was it for you? Well, first of all, um, I, had, I was really in trouble when I started this mm. thing, and I was, I was struggling a lot, and I was, had a lot of anxiety. I had something called globalized anxiety disorder, I know in retrospect, which means that I was anxious all of the time. I mean, 24 hours a day, I was terrified. Um, and I was depressed a lot. And so the very first meditation, I tried many things. The very first meditation hit me 
like a hammer. It was just very noticeable. It was like, whoa, what was that? And um, it, it, well, it hasn't always been like that, but that first meditation said there's really something here that's possible for you, for me. Um, so you basically you got your mantra and you were doing 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening, and you're saying straight away there was impact. Oh, the very first meditation, when I first learned yeah. how to meditate, there was an impact to it. And that's not the case for everybody. It just happened to work for me very, very well. And as I say, I tried other paths, but this one seemed to work for me. But what happened? So what was the difference? Well, as opposed to talk about the difference between the first meditation, let me talk about the difference between what I was experiencing as okay, a whole. Okay. The meditation itself was and, and remains very easy to do, so I could do it on a regular basis. I talk to a lot of people, even today, that say, oh, I can't meditate, it's just too hard. And, and for me, to do TM has always been very effortless and always rather pleasant. So that's been a good piece of it. But more important than that, there's a kind of becoming simpler in the process of doing meditation. It's as if you can let all the sort of chatter go and become more quiet. You can almost feel yourself dropping into a space that's sort of like that, where you kind of open out. And I find that very um, satisfying. I don't want to say that happens every time, and it certainly doesn't happen every time for most, most folks, but when it works particularly well, it's particularly delicious in that sense. But I think more important than the meditation itself for me has always been what happens afterwards. Um, so that I began to feel like I'd be driving sometimes and all of a sudden my world would sort of calm down. Or it's as if uh, I was in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the time. Uh, it was as if, as if Cambridge became quieter for a while. Or it's as if my life itself started to kind of Get it? I, it was as if I was able to get my life together a little more, a little more effortlessly, and and so I was starting to notice real results from the thing. And mm -hmm. that, so the promise that my life would be perfect didn't come to somebody that wasn't hearing and seeing. Life actually start to get better a little bit, and I, I imagine that it would just get better and better and better, and things would just be woo, you know, like that. So the the effect of meditation for me has always been good. Because um, at one point you were doing seven to eight hours a day meditation. Yeah, under which guidance. Which is a big commitment. It was. And I was off for a nine-month meditation retreat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a big commitment. And um, perhaps the most <laughs> pleasant year of my life, I must say, Ian. It was just, I look back on that time and I think, God, what a lucky guy I was to be able to do that. To be able to create that time and have enough money to pay for the hotel and... It was wonderful. It was an absolutely wonderful experience, and I met some wonderful folks there, too. And when you do that length of meditation, your mind calms down, but your mind still obviously has thoughts, and those thoughts impact you. So what actually changes? Uh, I think what you're pointing to is what, what changed for me. So yes, let me talk yes, about that. Yes, exactly. Let me talk about that. Yeah. Um, I don't need to go into too much detail, but imagine that, um, here's a nice way to think of it. Im imagine that as you're talking to me, this may be true actually, that as you're talking to me, you're talking to me, but then behind you is a thought about the, the tech guy that's out there, and behind that is a thought about, oh, don't forget to pick up the milk, and behind that is one of some snatch from a Beatles tune, and behind that is, oh, I have to get the oil changed. You know, so imagine that it's like your life is full of it's like you're watching a movie, but behind the movie, is, you can see another scrim, and then another scrim, and another scrim, and another scrim. Well, imagine that all of those other scrims, one day or over time, just kind of the light shifts, and all those scrims just fade away. And so that what you're doing is you're still in your life. You're still thinking your thoughts. You're still doing whatever you do. You still might be anxious or depressed. And yet, behind it is just quiet. So it's as if you're, you're sort of surrounding your own life with a sense of, well, technically, with a sense of the infinite or a sense of a kind of expanded silence. And so that the shift for me wasn't in the content of my life, but rather the replacement of all the background chatter with just the sense of quiet, the sense of who I am or who I was or however you say that. 
So that that's the, perf that, that's the real change that happens, the change in who you are, not so much in the content of your life, but rather a change in who's holding or engaging or seeing the content of your life. Is this clear? Yeah, so it's as if some of the background layers disappear. Yeah. Um, but is the, you're still, are you still watching the thoughts or are the thoughts just happening and you go along with the thoughts? Uh, what happened to me was that the, the thinking process didn't seem to change much. I changed. So what was holding or seeing the thinking process is what shifts. So that what I used to, the, the experience I used to have when all this started was um, that there'd be a kind of jumble together of, um, you know, I'd look at a glass, for example, and I'd see the glass, and I, I know that I'm in here someplace, but there's a kind of, it's all integrated. There's a kind of me and the glass, and, and there was a sense of who I was was a kind of vague and, and vaguely localized. Okay, so that was the way it was. And then once silence takes on, the sense of who you are becomes quite clear. And the sense of who you are now is silence. Mm. I'm, as it says in the Upanishads, I'm that. Or the way I like to talk about it is, I'm that. Yeah? So, but the content of my thoughts, or the content of your thoughts, doesn't necessarily change. Certainly not right away. Yes. Over time they did. But. So you became aware that you were the silence more than the thoughts. Is that right? I'm trying oh, to... Oh, absolutely, and I wouldn't yeah. even use the word more. Um, yes, I became aware that I'm silent. The thoughts were still around. They're still yes. part of the experience as a whole of what it is to yes. be me after this. But it became quite clear that what I am is this, mm -hmm. or, or, or that, uh, however you say this, you know. So it became quite clear to me that what I am is this open, rather delicious sense of presence. But the th intriguing thing, thing for me is that in the book you talk about even though you became more and more aware you were the silence, you still had on a personality ego level, you still had the anxiety and the fear going on. It was like... Didn't change at all. There was like <laughs> these two worlds. Yes. And that was very disconcerting to me. But let's talk yes. about the two worlds, and then I'll talk about being disconcerted by it. Um, so that when, I, when all this started, I was, uh, I was really struggling with a lot of anxiety, which I don't struggle with so much anymore. Some, but not, not so much. Um, and yet at the same time, there was this sense of quiescence. Or as it says in the Upanishads, it's like you're living your life like a bird. A bird's eating and drinking and whatnot. But there's also a second bird, which is doing the watching of the first bird. Okay. And it's almost like they're two entirely separate birds. And they're both part of me, so that this anx anxious, happy, goofy, whatever I am, part of me is still operative, still doing this thing. But now there's this new sense of, oh, that's what I am. I get it. Yes. So that there's that kind of shift is, an, is, is what, what I think uh, the traditions are talking about. Yeah. So part of you must have wanted this silence to be all-pervading to be the central part of your life. Absolutely, and it was kind of natural that I would want that because here I'd been spending all this time and I thought, oh my goodness, my life was gonna become great and, and it's part of the whole gestalt of the era. It's like, oh, meditation's gonna do it all and we all thought it was gonna be wonderful. So then when the silence comes on and my life doesn't dramatically change, mm. yeah, I was, I was, I had no idea what was going on. And in fact, when this first had happened to me, I, th I thought, oh, there's something wrong here. I'm, 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 the, 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 my, my meditation must be broken or I can't be doing this stuff right. This is not working because it was not life transforming. I'd, I'd go down, for example, I was in this kind of um, hotel and I'd go down the steps and I knew I was going to see so-and-so, a girl generally, and, and um, you know, I'd be anxious. It's like, oh, my God, what will I say? And, and you know, so I was, it was not transforming me, the, the fact that I was keeping the silence was not doing what I thought I was going to do. And so for many, many years, I, I didn't tell anybody about this stuff mm. because I thought this can't be it. It can't be what this is supposed to be about. I know also from reading the book, you would feel what you called stillness in your body. It would start in a certain part of your body and then it would start to expand. Yeah. So you had a, like a, 
a physical experience of that. Yeah, this was very physiological for me, or mm. uh, somatized. Um, yeah, it started at the back of my neck, and the silence was sort of back here. And then after, I don't know, four, five, six years, I began to realize I had silence that was up like this, and then another yeah. five, six years, it was like my whole head, and it was very physical. It was very, um, and, and I hear people talk about chakras. For me, the chakras were sort of a vague part of this, but not, this was not centered on that. This sort of started in my head and kind of worked its way out. Yeah. So they, I think my experience in that way is unusual, by the way. I hadn't read of that before. Yeah, yes. I've talked to a lot of people about this, and I've never heard anybody describe yeah. quite, quite this. And at one point, you were hearing whispering noises, which must have been quite disconcerting. Oh, that was before I started meditation. I, was, I told that story in the book, and it was um, psychologically probably the worst moment of my life. Yeah, I think mm. I was having a, what I hear in retrospect was probably a psychotic episode. So yeah, it was very scary. Yes. But that was before I started meditation. Okay. Was not part but of you this. went through difficult times, didn't you? Because you also say in the book at one point, I, again before meditation, you considered suicide too. Yeah. Yeah, I feel very lucky. I, I had one friend who did kill himself back then. I, I was at the I was in college, and and I had one friend that did kill himself back then, and, and yeah. I could have, sure I could have. I don't know why I didn't. But so when I started meditation, it was a big deal. I was yes. I was desperate. Yeah. And so the fact that this stuff was able to help at all was just a real gift for me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very grateful. Yeah. And I'm also remembering that there was a, a point which you have very fond memories of when you had a spiritual experience. You, were, you had an MGB sports car. What well, did I tell the story, that story in the book? And you <laughs> were driving at 78 miles an hour. Yeah. And you, and it, you realized that for a few seconds you had no anxiety. It was just, as I put it later, it was just me, the steering wheel, the hood, and the, and the road. And I'm still a bit of a speed demon, so I, I must say, and, and I still enjoy driving fast. But that was my first, what I now regard as, um, that was my first spiritual experience. Yeah. I, d I had no word like that at the time. I just thought, whoa, that's cool. But I had no idea what it was. But that, that sense of being fully in what you're doing, of all your anxieties fading away, of all the concerns of the world fading away, and being fully in what you're doing, that's what I was also trying to describe when I described the scrims fading away. It's like that's, that's the kind of shift that, that, that I think these traditions are, are talking about. And I think that these, that people are, are in, in, whether we know it or not, are kind of after having a world, having a life yeah. in which you're really fully in it, where you're not quite so distracted by 18 things and you're fully engaged in a conversation or when you watch the stoplight at the intersection, then you just watch and then when it turns green, you see it. I mean, it's the ability to be in your life and not someplace else when you're here. Yes. I think that that's, that's certainly what Eckhart Tolle is talking about when he talks about being present. It's certainly what I've been after. And I think that that's the kind of thing that happens when, when this other stuff, your, the concerns of your life kind of fade away. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I've looked at this a lot in my life. It's this thing, and you, you read it all over the place, being in the moment. Yes. And it is this practice in Buddhism, it's mindfulness yes. about being here and being present, being aware of what you're doing. But of course, in doing that, it's a good practice, but it's well within duality because there is an awareness of being here. Yes. And of course, that's two. Yeah. And yet, I suspect what happened to you in the sports car, and I know this in my own life, is there's times where you're so present and aware. There's no awareness of it at the time. But afterwards, there's a realization that actually that was actually being truly there. Present. Truly present, yeah. yeah. And I think that, that the idea that that can be with us more and more, that can be with us on a permanent basis, I think is very, very unusual. But I think that that, that that is what we're after in the spiritual life. I think that that sense of being present all the time without any extra effort yes. is what we're about. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm just reading some notes I made from the book. The, the, there was a retreat in Mallorca um, where you talk about the sense of who or what I was instantly changed. I was now the new bottomlessness. The vast openness was now me. Yeah, let, let me see if I can help your, your, our hearers um, understand that. Silence itself, mo many people have had an experience like the one in the MG, 
or something in prayer or something in meditation or something when they're listening to music. Many people have had the sense of being present. But if you are, are in that place of presence on a long-term basis, you start to be able to sort of sense what it is a little more clearly. And I think what's happening when we're present is that we're becoming, as it were, recognizing that we are that, that we are this sense of openness. And I think, I know what happened to me back in that experience in, May, in, in the shift that happened in Majorca was that that became what I am. So that it's, it's, it, there's a sense that you start to carry of, I am this openness, this sense of vastness, this sense of no top, no bottom. There's just a sense of openness. Mm -hmm. And that's different than it used to be for me. And I think, I'm probably for yourself as well, that's, I think that these experiences are strikingly yet quietly different than things were. Yeah, and it's this whole um, notion, and I think, again, you're probably hinting at it in the uh, Enlightenment, eh, what it's cracked up to be, that there's actually the individual gets enlightened. And, of course, your experience and many other people's experiences, it doesn't happen that way. It's not that I feel enlightenment, I get enlightenment. Something else happens that you realise that actually what you truly are is what you call the vastness or the bottomlessness that yeah. doesn't stop. Yeah. You realize, ah, that's who I am. It's not me trying to get enlightenment, and that becomes totally irrelevant. Yeah, it, it's almost as if the, the silence is now beneath, or I talked about the two birds, so the silence is back here, or the silence is beneath yes. my individuality, beneath what I am, so that the sense of me as Robert is not that changed, but it's like, uh, you know, what is, what is doing the watching, what is the witness part here, is beneath what's, yes. what I'm doing in my life. So that the, what I'm doing in my life hasn't shifted that much. That's what you're describing as the individuality. But there's this sense here of, oh, that's what I've always been and didn't quite know it. Mm -hmm. um, so that it's, it's kind of that discovery or that finding of the sense of presence or openness, yeah. And, and the word vastness is my favorite word for this, but, and it's because there's a sense that you're just big. <laughs> a sense that you're just wide open. Yeah, it's good. That's a nice yeah. thing. <laughs> and then what did you find over the years was helpful in terms on the human level, on the eye level, of the anxiety being dissipated more, becoming less. Was there anything that you found that you were doing on that level, or was it more just uh, more the embodiment of the realization of who you truly was? No, was I, I think there's something very, very much that we can do on that one. And I think this is of concern to folks, and it's certainly been of concern to me. When I'm anxious, there's, there's something in there that I'm anxious about. This is the kind of trick I didn't know when I started. Uh, when I had the global anxiety thing, I don't know what that was about, but at, over time it started to be more and more specific. And generally I'm anxious about something that I don't quite want to say to myself. For example, mm -hmm. I'm afraid that you're not going to like me. And so that when I walk into this interview, there might be that bit of fear, that bit of anxiety about, is he going to respond well, are we going to get along? And that I feel is anxiety. I think the trick for me, and I think the trick for a lot of folks, is to start to tell yourself what is really so, what is really true. Mm. For example, for me to actually say to myself, as I did before I walked in the studio, oh, I'm, I'm a little anxious about who this guy's going to be. That actually is, I think, the key trick that we can offer one another. I think the reason that we run, the reason that we get depressed, the reason that we get anxious about things, is that there's a truth that we're not quite ready to or willing to say to ourselves about what's really happening or what's really going on. So that um, if I can tell myself, or even better if I can tell somebody else, the real truth about what's going on for me, there's a kind of freeing in that. 
And it's, it, the interesting thing is, Ian, it's the same sense of freedom that comes with the silence. When I've been keeping a secret from myself, when I've been, or keeping a secret from a friend, and I don't tell somebody that secret, or I don't tell myself the secret, I'm kind of running from it. I kind of duck it. I sort of hide from it. But if I can tell myself what I'm really afraid of, or what's really happening, or what's happening between two people, I don't have to run anymore. I don't have to, mm -hmm. anything to be afraid of. I've said it. The thing mm -hmm. I was hiding from, I've said. So that for me, the trick in letting go of anxiety has to do with telling the real truth. And that same skill is the way that I find that my conversations with people can become increasingly real and increasingly honest and open. Being able to tell the real truth. You know yeah. what I'm describing? Yeah, and also you talk quite movingly in later on in the book about a process you went through with your wife. Oh, yeah. Where you were having some difficulties and you just sat down and you were honest and you just listened to each other. And that, from what you were saying, opened up something in the relationship. Uh, the key was listening, but the key was also being able to speak what was true. Yes. Um, and, and I've been running from that truth for a long time and, yeah. and not willing to say it both to myself and to her. Yeah. And it's not so much saying it to her, by the way. It's not so much saying, you've been doing this to me, but it's rather for me to be able to say to her, you know, I think I've been doing this to you. I think I've been using my fantasy life, for example. Yeah. I think I've been using my fantasy life as a way to keep you at bay. Once I was able to say that line, the whole thing shifted because now I, the truth was now in the space. And it's an amazing gift, truth telling. Yes. Don't you think? It is. And it, but it needs the kind of, I don't know, structure is the wrong word, but it, need, it needs the openness there, doesn't it? Because you can say something and you're revealing yourself, but it also needs to be heard by the other that Absolutely. it affects. Without that dynamic, Absolutely. something doesn't heal there. No, it doesn't heal. And in fact, you can't really tell the truth if you know the other person is not ready to hear it. And that's, it's, yes. it's almost a catch-22. Yes. You have to both be able to and willing to just, I, I, my phrase for it is drop down. So that you, you need to both be able to drop down into a sort of more open and more honest space and then listen and speak. And the listener calls out the speaker and the speaker calls out the listener and there's a kind of a mutual discovering that happens. And the interesting thing is, and I mentioned it before, but the interesting thing is that sense of openness that can happen between two people through truth-telling is the same openness that I discovered many years before sitting in meditation. Mm -hmm. That sense of without any resistance, without any boundaries. And so that if I'm not keeping something from you, I don't have any boundaries there. I don't have any resistance. Mm -hmm. yeah? So our, the word boundaries is confusing there, but I don't have anything that I'm sort of keeping holding you at bay with. Yeah? Mm. It seems to me, as, as, as we continue our discussion, it's like I'm just very aware of these the stillness, the vastness, ground of being, whatever we call it. And then on the human level, it's as if it, the, gr the ground of being, whatever, can support what happens at the human level in terms of a healing and a completion and letting go. But the still, needs to be work and a process that goes on there in terms of a kind of almost like a clearing or a dissolving and it, it's that and the way truth is can be so healing if it's heard is it lets go it helps to let go of the knots in the ego the the jamming up in the ego that happens the contraction nicely put i, I also am very curious about one thing and i don't know how we're going to know the answer but as we're talking I'm feeling a kind of openness in a space around us here. Yeah? Do you feel that also? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's always interesting to me because when I feel it, the other guy always feels it, the other yeah. woman always yeah. feels it. But in any case, I feel a sense of sort of openness here, and I wonder if our viewers can sense that. There's a quality of being willing to allow silence into the space, a quality. It's almost as if my chest feels like it's going like that. And I wonder if the viewers can sense that. I think, I think this stuff is sort of communicated in ways we don't know. Yeah, there's a field here, and, and I think um, from our experience of Conscious TV in the past, there's been certain interviews where people have definitely connected with the field in the interview. 
The even people, people home, that are watching it yes, through the internet. It, are, yeah, yeah. yeah, even though they're miles away and whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and doing something completely different. There's yeah. a, at the end of the day, if they're able to tune in, and it's not even sort of a conscious process, so tuning in happens to that field that is here, then yes, something can resonate and something can Interesting. I'm, I'm glad, to hear, I'm glad yeah. to hear that people can sense yeah. this through TV. Yeah. But in any case, you asked me, uh, a couple minutes ago, you asked me about, <clears throat> um, or you were describing the way it is when two people start to work through things and that it requires a certain kind of listening and a certain kind of speaking. I think that, it, it, that you're right, that it requires us to be open, as it were, beneath our words or in the interstices between our words. But there's also, there's also real work to be done in terms of the way that we are with one another, sharing honestly, making things safe to share, being willing to talk between folks in a way that's increasingly honest. And there's a kind of spiraling in or down I sometimes experience where people are talking and you discover and then the, the other person discovers and you discover and there's a kind of mutual spiraling that happens like that. But I think that that requires the willingness to s speak. Sometimes the stuff that's scary, it's always mm. a little, um, it's always vibratory when you get to what is real, you know? Yeah. So, um, so it's both this quality of the openness of consciousness, but it's also the rather specific stuff that we are able to do with our words and with our, with our sense and our promises and our, and our agreements. I know that one person that was helpful for you in life was Ram Dass. Mm. When you met him, you had told him of your experiences and he gave you a kind of uh, clarification and confirmation. That yeah, Do you want to talk about that? Okay. Um, the experience I was describing to you that had happened in Majorca had now happened probably about 20 years prior to this. Yes. And I had been really wondering about what had happened to me. And I, and I went to Ram Dass, who, by the way, turns out to be one of the funniest people I know. He's really just a hoot. And we're both Jewish, and we were able to share that, and we had a great time together. And, and um, um, I took him aside, and I said, look, I did not talk to Marshi, my guru, about all this. And I, I've been wondering about, is this, I've, I've come to understand what had happened to me 20 years, 30 years before as what the Hindu tradition calls moksha and, and enlightenment. And I wonder, and I described it to him, and I described what had happened to me and what had been the case for 20 years. And, and he simply just looked me in the eye and he said, yes, this is that. Yeah. And I walked away just, I just started to weep. I'm not quite sure why I did. It was one of those moments where it was just like, Finally, I could stop asking the question. Oh, fine. And there was also probably a little headiness. It was like, oh, cool. But it was, it was a great gift to me. I, I'm uh, t uh, to this day grateful to that man. And just for saying, yeah, you can stop worrying about it now. This is that's what this is. Don't yeah. worry about it. You know. So, yeah. And the confirmation was just a real gift to me. Yes. It's funny you would bring that up. Sometimes we need this encouragement, don't we? This yeah. this confirmation and. Yeah. Uh, because even though there's this strong feeling and there's a knowing, there's still the doubts circulate. And it yeah, needs to be and there's a lot of confusion about it. Yeah. There's, there's a sense of, is this really? Is it? I don't know. Is this maybe yeah. something else? And, and um, so since that time, I've, I've, I've had the privilege of doing the same thing for three people that have come to me and asked me a similar question. And, and I, it's always felt like, it's not much you need to say. Yeah, you can stop worrying about this. It's really all you need to say. And, and you can help people understand when it's not. So yeah, I think it's, a, it's one of the kinder things we can do as human beings for one another is to help each other name what is difficult to name for us. That naming process. And what I hear in this whole conversation you and I have had so far is that, that there's a kind of distinction here between how we talk about something, the ego stuff, the anxiety stuff, and this other sense of the openness. And what Ram Dass was able to do was to help me stop worrying about this in this sort of more verbal uh, linguistic side of our lives and just say, yeah, this is it, you know, not, not to worry about it so much. And yet it didn't, it didn't change the experience any, but it did change my kind of constant wondering. So it was helpful on the more everyday ego side of things. Yeah. 
But one of, the, one of the things I also enjoyed in the book was when you talked about your Forge Institute, which you started, and there you get together people from different traditions for a weekend, or maybe a little bit longer sometimes, and it's an open space insofar as there's no leader, there's no one that's higher than the other, but you're sharing in terms of where you are and your process, your understanding, your realisation. And if you just talk us through how that, how that was and how that is, because that's quite, you know, with all the conflict in, in, in the world and all the people saying, well, I know, my mind's superior to yours, this is the real God or whatever. This is such an important thing of bringing together us not only on the, the level of knowing who we are, but also on the humanness again. Good for you. I, as you described it very nicely. Um, w I started the forge, and, and I want to I want to see if I can get this right. I started the forge, but in the process of starting it, I knew that um, I had no interest in and uh, being a guru, being the sort of putting myself above. I had no interest in being part of an organization in which it was everybody believing the same thing. That's just not interesting to me. So I started it, and I started finding people that said, "Yeah, let's play that way," and so that there's a quality that we look for, and it centers on truth-telling. Um, and the quality is that we can actually share what's going on, and when things are hard, we can say that, and we can say, here's my piece of it, and the other guy can say honestly, or the other woman can say honestly, here's my piece of it. And something happens then when you can do that. And I've seen many, many organizations, many too many organizations, that people get very much like this. But if the policy, if the corporate culture is such that people are really willing to say, you know, I didn't do this one so good. I, I think I messed you up, or I think I did something to you that I don't feel good about. And then the other person can say, yeah, and I think my piece of this was blah, blah, blah. And that now you've got, now you've got the real exploration of how this thing happened, didn't happen. Um, and I think there's a real possibility for the world in that. It's very rare, but not entirely unheard of. Good, mm. healthy teams do this. Now, one of the points I want to connect here is that the ability to do that, the ability to say, here's my truth and here's my truth, okay, let's work this through and now we go, is the same ability that I had with my wife when I said, I'm doing this to you, mm. lady. And she said back to me, yeah, and I'm doing a piece of this here. And it's the same quality that I noticed with silence itself. There's a sense of non-resistance. There's a sense of you don't have to fight anything. There's a sense of openness. So that what my life has been dedicated to is to figure out ways to make it possible that I and everyone that I'm in contact with can speak the truth with increasing depth and increasing freedom. Because I think right there is real possibility for the world. Mm. I am to some extent still an idealist here, you know, and I want to say, I think this can really help. I don't know if it's the only thing that can help, but I do know it can help. And it can help my marriage, it can help marriages, it can help friendships, it can help in teamwork, it can help. And my, I sort of have this vague sense that if, if, um, a large group of people could have that as a policy, that things would be much more interesting and much more open. When things get stuck, everything gets all frozen, but it's the, when you learn to be able to be able to say, yeah, I'm doing this, and this is, this is what I think, and when you're able to say that, I think things can move much more easily. It's almost the difference between a frozen river and a free river. There's a sense yes. of open flow that can happen between folk. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. That's a, that's a wonderful piece of this. And I also uh, know from the book that you go on these retreats on your own. You spend yeah, I'm a, a retreat week junkie. Yeah, right. yeah. Once a year, every year. Yeah. So t t just talk me through that. How that is for you. You going? You going? Are you going completely on your own, or, or is there? Well, I start. I started out going uh, as part of the TM organization. And at some point, I thought, well, I just try it all by myself once and just see if it was if it was scary, if it was effective. And the first time I did it, I was a little nervous about it. But remember, I've now spent months and months and months and months with my eyes closed. So it's like I kind of know how to do this. I know what the problems are. I would not recommend this. You know, don't do this one at home. I would not recommend this for somebody that has a had a lot of experience doing retreats. Um, but yes, I go off. I meditate for roughly six hours a day when I go off mm -hmm. on retreat. 
Um, I do it every year. I go for 10 days. I, I um, you know, and I have my practice. So what I'll do, now this is my own particular way to do it, but it's, tr it's trained by the TM way, is I'll meditate for roughly an hour. I come out, I, I do 15 minutes of yoga, and then I do 15 minutes of just go for a walk or, you know, bodily functions. And then I'll meditate for another hour. So I'm spending a lot of time with my eyes closed. But that's my particular way to do this. I would not encourage everybody to do something like that. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. But I, I, I love it because it's, it's become the kind of backbone of my life. For me, and I don't know how, how true this is, it's probably true for you, but I don't know if this is true for everybody, but for me, I am thrilled by the fact that my spiritual life has continued to develop in very real and almost measurable ways over the years. And I'm very pleased about it because it's interesting. And it's also a measure of, an, not measure of, but it's also become, my life has become increasingly free in part as a result. So that I'm quite committed to doing these things and I'm quite committed to continuing to see my spiritual life grow and develop. And that's been a privilege of my life. Um, and, you know, I know, I have lots of friends that, you know, don't have a kind of systematic way like, like I do, and I think that's their path, and that's, that's just fine. But this is my way, and this is, you know, going off on retreat every year is something I would not give up. I just love doing it. And for me, every year, it's, it's, I sort of discover these new things. It's like, oh, that would, that's what happens to a human being next. And so it's a kind of an interesting journey I've been on, and it's, you know, to some extent, the book, uh, Enlightenment Ain't What It's Cracked Up To Be, is, is a story of a guy that, has continued to do these retreats and is trying to make sense of a life that's sort of centered on meditation and centered on, on the whole question of what enlightenment is about and trying to come to terms with what these shifts actually do. And, and um, yeah, so the retreats are very much a part of my life. Yours too, I presume. Yeah? Yes, no, I, yeah. I, I've, I enjoy being on retreat, yeah. yes, yeah. So do, do you, do you, envisage a place where you can be so rooted in who you really are that the anxiety is minimal or doesn't exist? Or do you feel that's something that you just live with in, in, in this life? Oh, interesting question. Um, the, the question of anxiety for me has been a very interesting, it's part of the real challenge of the whole thing. So when I started meditation, I was anxious all the time. Ian, I remember the one day, I was, it was probably, I was probably about 31, 32, and I started meditation when I was 22. So this is 10 years after I started meditation. I was walking across 114th Street in New York, and I realized, oh my God, I'm not anxious. <laughs> and it was, I honestly didn't know you could have such an experience. I thought everybody had that experience all, I thought everybody was anxious all the time. Huh. And then I realized I wasn't, I didn't have that experience. And then maybe three or four years later, I was like, oh, I haven't been anxious much these days. And, and or no, no, three or four years later, it was, I haven't been anxious for the last hour. And then another three or four years, and it was, you know, I don't get anxious that much anymore. And that went on for many years where I just didn't feel like I got anxious very much. And then I had a, I had a moment, and this is probably 10, 15 years later, where I actually felt above a line, positively good. Not because, you know, I just got a job or you know, somebody smiled at me, but it was just, it just felt good. And again, I didn't know that was possible. Mm. Um, I still deal with anxiety sometimes when things come up, like walking into this studio. I didn't know how this was going to go. You and I had never met. And I was a little like, eh, you know, what's that going to be like? Um, but it feels real. It feels like I'm anxious about something. I was anxious about you. And I was anxious about this interview. Um, no, I don't think that will ever go away because mm. it was a real concern, you know, to some extent. I didn't know how this was going to go. So that the kind of slightly on edgedness that I felt, I think, was quite practical in a certain way. But that sense of indeterminate anxiety, the sense of being anxious for no obvious reason, I'd say, yeah, I can very much envision a life. And I think people can and should envision a life in which that's not so much part of their everyday life. Yeah. And when you, when you do a retreat for a week, yeah. do you feel everything settles down much more calmly? Or is it some people when they go on retreats, they say, actually, 
God, it was really difficult. I had all this fear that I didn't realise I had, and I get in touch with it, and it starts to bubble up, and I have to just sit with it. Is that something that is your experience? Well, well again, I've been meditating for 40-some years, so yeah. uh, in the beginning, that was very common in my, in my experience, in my meditations. I'd go off on retreat, and I'd, like, you know, things would get very difficult. But I've been doing this year after year yes. after year, and, and, and at some point, that kind of just fades away. So my main experience now is that I go and I tend to sleep a lot the first two days because I've always, I'm always, right? <laughs> I've always underslept. Yeah. So, you know, I, I find myself getting pretty sleepy the first couple of days, and then phew, things just take off, and that's pretty common. And, yeah. and then things start to kind of develop, and, you know, whatever interesting things might be going on starts to appear. It's a pretty rare retreat where something interesting doesn't happen to me. Yeah. But I feel very lucky. But that's my peculiar life. It's, you know, that's, that's the way my physiology works. Yeah. So in that sense, I feel kind of fortunate because it keeps me going. Yeah. What does keeping you going mean? Well, it keeps me going back to retreat, for example. Um, I'll yeah. tell you about the last one. Uh, about four or five years ago, um, something weird was happening on the muscles inside of my ears. And I began to realize that if this, when this muscle would sort of relax, and I don't know how else to describe it, it was a muscle inside my ears. Um, and, and this muscle kind of relaxed, and my breathing began to go, be much more open. And that was quite striking. And then uh, the retreat that I, d I had last September, um, it was as if that sense of open breathing, now I was starting to experience it on walks, talking to folks, that sense of openness now had gained a new level of, as it were, maturity or clarity. And so that, that's the kind of thing that has tended to happen to me over the years. It's very almost uh, tactile. Yeah. But, but again, this is my particular experience. I don't think this is true for everybody, but, that's, yeah. but it keeps me going in the sense of, I'm quite hot to go see what my next retreat does. You know, I'm, I'm interested in seeing the development of human life in that sense. And every time one of those changes happen, I do find myself a little easier in my own life, a little more present, a little more ready to be with folks. Mm. There's um, the beginning of the book, there was uh, four lines that I wrote down which I enjoyed. And you say, in the end, what matters most is how well did you live, how deeply did you love, how much did you give, and how well did you learn to let go. And in a way, we've touched on all of those things, and uh, especially the letting go. And it seems that that has been a key to you, although it didn't necessarily take you to the, the vastness but the letting go has helped support that fastness in your life. Yeah. Well, the letting go has, uh, it, it's almost as if you have the letting go of the anxieties, letting go of the secrets, letting go of the stories I don't want to tell myself, allows me to be a little more open. And then that, uh, that sense of openness allows the sense of the infinite to be a little more clear. And, that's, and that openness the, of the infinite gives me just a little more strength to tell yet one more level of truth, and that level of truth tells. So there's a kind of a back and forthness. It is not simple and linear in a way that I'd sort of expected. It. It's very natural, and the whole process has been very real, but not systematic in the way I was sort of thinking. I thought, oh, you find silence, and everything gets easy. Everything is wonderful. Yeah. And it's not been like that at all, but rather the silence serves as a kind of spine for the development of my own spine, for the development of my own maturation. Mm -hmm. And that maturation has itself helped silence become increasingly mature. And there's a sense of the openness itself becomes more and more obvious, more and more present. So that there's a sense of seeing it even, even there, you know, even though it's not me. But there's also something in that quote I want to also respond to, this word giving. Because you, you mentioned part of the line that I quoted there or, or wrote there was, and also how much did you give? And I think that when I was very, pre when I am very preoccupied with myself, when I was very preoccupied with, with, my, with myself when I was in my 20s, but when I am very preoccupied with myself, I don't have much left over to give. I'm, I'm kind of busy 
trying to find what mm -hmm. I need to find. Yeah. But the, when, I, when I've become increasingly satisfied with what I am, or increasingly unconflicted, or decreasingly conflicted with what I am, th there's just more of me that I have to offer to the world, more of me to give from. And I think in a kind of natural way that that trajectory is the way I think that the spiritual life can work for folks. In that, you know, you sort of work on yourself, you work on yourself, and finally you feel as, you know, I've kind of got this now. <laughs> and, and then you just, you know, the Forge Institute, for example, is my way to help people find one another, yeah. my way to help people sort of make make contact with one another, the classes that we teach and how to do this. I think it's all connected. So yeah. I think it, it becomes easier to give when you are stronger in what you yeah. are and more authentic. It takes grace, doesn't it, for true transformation to happen. Yeah. Ultimately, it's the yeah. grace of God or whatever. That, yeah. yeah. I mean, the line that I like about that is that um, we do the work and then grace does the important part. Yeah. <laughs> and grace is grace. You don't know if and when. Yeah. And somehow yeah. you trust and whatever happens, happens, basically. Yeah. And I think being honest with ourselves and being honest with one another is a key in, in, in allowing that to take place. Yeah. 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 Okay, we need to finish now. Oh, is our time up? My goodness, this is uh, this has gone quickly. Yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I think we've we've uh, covered a lot. Um, in a way, it's it's only a snapshot into your book. But uh, the thing I liked about the book most was that it had it had depth, but it had humanness and there was a degree of adventure. And it kind of it wasn't a classic page turner, but somehow I wanted to turn the page so it's uh, I would recommend this book for someone who's on the spiritual path and maybe slightly disillusioned because um, Robert gives you he, he give people hope not for the sake of giving people hope but by your own process there's something because you do share some depths of despair sometimes and somehow you get yourself out of it or something moves and you're in a different place. And I think that's what the spiritual life has to offer. That yes. is to say, there really is hope in the spiritual life. Yeah. And I think that the hope is not the kind of naive hope that we used to have when we were first starting. But there's a real baby in this bathwater and it's worth protecting and it's worth finding, yes. But yeah. thank you for all that you've said about the book. That's very sweet. And I'd like to offer back one, one thing about you. There's a lot of hype these days on TV, on the radio, and it's, it's, it's hard to find places that you can go for truly thoughtful conversations about what's important. And you do that well. I know how hard it is to keep one of these things going, and I know how challenging it can be. But you do it well, Ian, and I compliment you for it. I compliment you for the attempt and for this for the way that you go about doing this. This has been a real privilege to be part of your process. And um, th so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. OK. So thank you for watching Conscious TV. Here's the book again, Robert Foreman. And uh, I hope we see you all again soon. Goodbye.